Good morning. We this are is live. Senate Judiciary Committee, January 20th, 2020. We are going to end at 1145 today for those of you who are interested in order to give some people time to watch the inauguration of Joseph Biden and um, Kamala Harris. Uh, so uh, we're going to end at 11.45 this morning instead of noontime. Uh, the topic of today's hearings are, is S-30. It's a bill introduced by uh, Senator Baruth and 15 other senators, which, as you know, is a majority of the Senate. And uh, that um, it has to do with possession of firearms and in prohibited locations. The two page bill, it's S30. And I'm going to ask Eric to um, walk us through the bill uh, so that we can better understand uh, what's in it and what's not in it. And, but if Senator Bruce would like to make a short statement before we start, since he's the sponsor of the bill, he's more than welcome to do so. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, so uh, S30 is, as uh, the chair said, a short bill. It's not a simple bill in the sense that no gun safety bill is ever simple, but it was drafted um, a year ago before the pandemic in response to incidents that uh, I had been seeing around the country of um, people coming into government buildings with firearms and using them in an intimidating, sometimes threatening manner. So that was part of a bill to ban semi-automatic weapons in those spaces. Um, between then and now, as everyone knows, these incidents have intensified and increased in number to the point where several days ago, every state capital in the country was on a form of lockdown because of threats of armed uh, revolt, insurrection, protest, we're in a space where no one really knows uh, what to call it or how serious a situation we're in. Um, so this bill began to seem to me more and more uh, crucial, more and more necessary. And the pandemic intensified that in that anti-mask protests began to also merge with these armed uh, groups and people in stores have been threatened, people in hospitals, uh, people in daily life who ask others to wear a mask have started to be routinely assaulted and threatened. So we're in an unprecedented time. And what I tried to do in S30 is to strip down the bill that I had drafted uh, earlier into just the absolute minimum that I thought everyone might be able to agree on. And so what you see in front of you, as Eric will point out, is a prohibition on firearms in government buildings, hospitals, and childcare centers. And I think if you were to ask the average Vermonter, they would say that those are resoundingly common sense ideas that you don't need and you don't want guns in those areas. Um, so again, that's the spirit that this comes forward with, that it's a necessary measure right now and that it's been stripped down to the bare elements so that the most uh, people in the House and the Senate could agree on it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric with my thanks for helping me draft. Eric, please. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Eric. It's Patrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to talk about S30. First, I'll ask uh, Senator Bruth, if it, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, so as Senator Sears, <clears throat> excuse me, and Senator Bruth both indicated, this is uh, S30 is called an act relating to prohibiting possession of firearms at child care facilities, hospitals, 
and certain public buildings. Uh, you can tell from the title, actually, that this, this piece of legislation uh, doesn't affect uh, sort of what groups of people may possess firearms the way other statutes in Vermont do. It doesn't affect what types of firearms a person may possess. It's what's sometimes referred to as a location restriction. So sometimes th these sorts of laws are referred to in that manner. It's a location restriction. Uh, for the purposes of background, it may be helpful for, for the committee to know that Vermont already has two location restrictions on the books and it has for many years. Uh, in Title 13, you have statutes that prohibit the possession of firearms at both schools and courthouses. Those are uh, the school statute was passed in 1989. Uh, the courthouse's statute was passed in 1993. So you've had both of those location restrictions on the books for plus or minus 30 years now. Uh, in addition to that, interestingly, and I think the committee talked about this at its last meeting, although there's nothing in statute uh, prohibiting possession of firearms in the state house, there is a joint uh, House and Senate rule that it's Rule 26C, and that expressly does prohibit the possession of firearms in the state house. But it's a rule, not a statute. And uh, I spoke with the Chief Capitol Police Chief uh, Matt Romay about that, uh, just to see well, what would happen if if uh, a person did have a, a firearm in the state house and uh, the chief met, indicated that, you know, he would talk to the person and point out the rule and uh, try and uh, ask them to comply. But that if, uh, if that wasn't the case, then his options would be, you know, perhaps a, a trespassing or, or a breach of the peace sort of offense, but uh, there's no criminal offense for possessing in the state house. So uh, his options are, are what he indicated. He also just for, so the committee knows that he'd be happy to testify if the committee wanted to hear from him about uh, firearms in the state house. So um, just wanted to mention that. But that, that was his, uh, what he could offer for now. So the point is that, that statutorily in, you know, on the books now, you have two location restrictions, schools and courthouses. What S30 proposes to do is to add three more. And as Senator Baruth indicated, the three more are child care facilities, hospitals, and certain public buildings. Uh, the, what I was, thinking that I would do now is share my screen so that we could look at the language. Is that okay with you, Senator Sears? Does that make sense to, to yeah, do the walkthrough? Yeah, I do have a brief a, a question before you share the screen, Eric. Please, please Wanna do. Under, um, right now, I, um, if I go up to my local hospital, there's a sign saying that it's firearm and tobacco free. Um, and what would happen if I did carry a firearm into the hospital, which clearly is prohibited, similar to the state house, evidently a rule or whatever? What are the consequences for doing that under current law? I think it's <clears throat> probably similar to what the chief was facing with respect to the state house. As you said, it's it's not a criminal uh, prohibition. There's, it's not a person isn't committing a crime. But a, a private location is certainly permitted to decide whether or not to allow firearms on on site, but they would have to uh, see if, uh, you know, the circumstances supported a, a breach of the peace or a trespass kind of crime. And I think that probably would depend on the circumstances of each situation. And, but uh, um, I think those would be the options that, that I can think of right now. Thank you. That, that's helpful because, um, you know, I, I can remember, I, don't, I wasn't here when they did the schools in 1989, but I was here when the courthouse was in 1993. That was my first year and my first experience. <laughs> I thought it was that later than that, actually. On the courthouse. Yes, I, I was wondering the year too. I was surprised. It was, I thought it was late 90s. Yeah, I did too. Um, so please go ahead with the walkthrough and sharing the screen as well. Sure. Let me give that a try. So I'm going to try and pull up the bill itself here. All right. Was I successful? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> As I, you probably remember from the last time I shared this screen, uh, I can only see the document. So if someone, I'll, I'll try to pause regularly, but since I can't see 
somebody asking a question, please feel free to interrupt me or, or uh, just let me know if there's, uh, I should stop for a moment. So uh, turning to the language of the bill, as, as I mentioned, it's a, a, pro, a location restriction on possessing firearms at child care facilities, hospitals, and certain public buildings. You'll see that uh, it adds a new provision into the uh, weapons chapter of Title 13, the criminal code. Section 4023 is the new proposed section dealing with exactly what we just described, possession of firearms at prohibited locations. And that's subsection A, line 15, sets out what prohibition is. Person can't possess a firearm, shall not possess a firearm at a prohibited location. Now, prohibited location is a defined term, which we're going to see when we get to the definitions in a minute or two. But it's going to be essentially those three locations that I just described, child care facilities, hospitals, certain public buildings. But the penalty is in subsection B. You'll see that, that uh, it's a one-year misdemeanor with a $1,000 fine. Uh, that one-year misdemeanor is the same uh, penalty that you remember that the work that the committee's done in firearms area over the last several years. The one-year misdemeanor is typically what's used for the uh, background checks, underage sales, all those all of those provisions that you enacted, they had a one-year misdemeanor and a thousand-dollar fine. As it happens, the the uh, prohibitions on the books that I mentioned for schools and courts, those location restrictions also are a one-year misdemeanor. So it's consistent with that as well. Uh, although the fine in those cases is five hundred dollars, but that may just be because they were enacted thirty years ago. Um, but the uh, um, the uh, uh, Location restriction penalty, the one year is the same as uh, as the other firearm statutes that you have in cha in this chapter. So uh, that's the prohibition and the penalty. Subsection C, you'll see, is a couple of exemptions, and these are also standard for what you have in the firearm statutes uh, overall. You have an exemption for law enforcement officers. That's subdivision one on, on line 19. So law enforcement officers, both federal and state, uh, are exempted from this, would not be covered by the, by the prohibition. And in subdivision two, which is line three of page two, you'll see federal departments and agencies also exempted. So that would be for, could be, for example, uh, uh, members of the armed services, members of the National Guard, uh, that sort of thing. Um, that's, again, common language. Sometimes some statutes specifically identify armed forces, National Guard members, uh, but in this case, it just uses the more broad, the broad phrase of, of uh, any, any representative or entity of the United States or federal or state government. Um, so that's the prohibition and the exemptions that brings us to really to what in some, some sense is uh, the meat of the bill, which is of course the definition section. That is, well, so what is being uh, swept in here? What is it that's being prohibited and how do we define the places and the firearms themselves? So the first definition that you come to, because uh, obviously key, since this is a prohibition on possession of firearms, you have to define what you mean by that. And that's uh, line six, page two, the firearm definition you'll see is the same. It just cross-references the definition that you already have, which that statute uh, is the felons in possession of firearms statute which is based itself on the federal definition. So essentially you're using the federal definition, which you've also used, again, all these recent uh, measures that the legislature has taken with respect to firearms have used this same definition. It's no different. And what it does is basically excludes uh, antiques, muzzle loaders, uh, black powder, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the committee remembers that that's standard language that you've used a number of times now recently. So it's basically any firearm except for, uh, as I say, antiques, muzzle loaders, uh, black powder are excluded from that. So that's the, the firearm definition that you use. Then move on to prohibited location. So obviously the next key point is, okay, where, can, where, are the, where is the possession of firearms prohibited? And as we mentioned at the beginning, three different places. The first is a child care facility. Also, you'll see that uh, it cross-references another existing definition in statute. And that definition is in the licensing, licensing statute uh, for child care facilities. So it makes some sense that uh, you know, child care facilities have to be licensed under state law. And if they meet this definition of a child 
care facility, uh, it has to be licensed. And so that's the same definition here. If, it, if it's a facility that has to be licensed as a child care facility, then that um, is the facility where a firearm cannot be possessed. You'll see that there's an exemption uh, after that cross-reference line nine. Child, it doesn't include a child care facility uh, that is a family daycare home that provides care on a regular basis in the caregiver's own home. So again, the idea is if, if obviously it's in a person's own home, uh, it wouldn't make sense to prohibit the person from possessing firearms there. So that's why, why that circumstance is carved out. But other than that, uh, the, the cross-references to the existing licensing statute and uh, I paused because I thought I heard perhaps someone asking a question, but um, I, I'm actually, uh, I have a question, even if somebody else does, they can raise their hand or, or shout it out because I can't see everyone right now. Um, when we say prohibited location, and I remember this discussion during our, um, back when we did the courthouses, is the location, and when we did something with schools, which was after I came. So um, what about the grounds of a school, the ground or a family child care, family, uh, a child care facility, the grounds of a uh, office building, a hospital and so forth. I think, uh, is it the building? Because the sign in the state house is into the building. It doesn't say you couldn't carry a firearm outside the building. What is the intent here? Well, I think that uh, at least with respect to the, um, the government building, you see the language in line 13 specifies that it's the building. So in that case, clearly a publicly owned building. Uh, the child care facility I'm looking at, uh, and I also emailed these links to, to Peggy last night, so uh, you can pull these up if you want, but I'll, I'll read it to you right now. The definition of child care facility that this cross-references, which is in Title 33, says any place or program operated as a business or service on a regular or continuous basis, then it goes on to describe the not, nothing related to the location, but more the function, you know, whose primary function is protection, care, and supervision of children under 16 years of age outside their homes, et cetera, et cetera. But the operative language in response to your question, Senator Sears, was, was the first few words, which was any place uh, operated as a business. Uh, so I would read that in that case as, for example, I mean, I, I know that uh, just as, the, as an example, the child care facility that I used, you know, there was a building, but there was also an outside area, a playground area where the kids would go out and play and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, so I would read that because it says place as including that area. But and I want to make sure at the well, that's the time we had issues regarding somebody comes to pick up their child at a at a school and they've just been out hunting and the firearm is in the in a rifle rack in the pickup truck visible to everybody, is that a violation? Yes, and in fact, that, that in the case, parking. yeah, you, 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 that statute was set up to provide different penalties depending on whether it was the building or the grounds. That's, a, right. that's right. So I would, I, I'm concerned about, again, the hospital, um, because there are huge parking lots in most hospitals. I. I drove, I had a doctor's appointment at the Rutland Hospital, and believe me, I drove about four miles trying to find actual entrance to the doctor's office. So, and I was still in their parking lot. Um, and though <laughs> Senator Nitka knows what I'm talking about, she's been there, I guess. Uh, I think we have to be really clear that we're talking about the building and not necessarily the parking lot. Um, Senator Sears. So that concerns me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if I could, I agree with you. Senator Baruth uh, and then Senator I, White. I agree with you in terms of the hospital and the publicly owned building for government functions. The child care facility, I think, is different because, as Eric said, um, 
schools and childcare centers have uh, outdoor play areas, and those have been specifically targeted by mass shooters in the past. So um, mm -hmm. I, I would hate to have it be, I know now it's illegal, and correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, it's illegal to bring a gun onto a school playground. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Well, that's correct. I, so I would, I would want to mirror. It. Yeah. So I would want to mirror that in the childcare piece of this. I'm more comfortable with language on that that mirrors what we have for schools. Yeah. Because we've already had, you know, experience with that. People understand it, and I think most people thought a, a childcare facility was was a school and that that would be treated the same. I am concerned, however, about the definition, you know, as I said about the hospital parking lot, that it is the building and not necessarily outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see I, somebody going to the emergency room in an emergency and they've got a rifle in the back of their pickup. I didn't see them charged with that. And, the, and it's locked and they've gone into the emergency room. Senator White. I was going to um, echo Phillips, um, the child care, but the hospital and the publicly owned building, I think it really needs to be clear that it's just the building. It isn't the, the grounds. Agreed. Okay, Eric, thank you yeah, for that. I think, I'm, I I think I'm under... Sorry, go ahead, Senator Sears. Well, I think as we look at this bill, hopefully any redraft will... Uh, accommodate those two concerns. Yes, I think not? I'm following it. I think it's the idea is building only for the hospital, but what the child care facility uh, make clear that includes the grounds and consistent with what we've done for schools. Yeah, Joe? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, Joe has a comment or question or issue. Yeah, I, I look at the child care facility question as a place that is going to cause me problems. And a couple of years ago, we passed legislation requiring licensure of people who are working in child care centers. And I know there's a difference between child care facility and a family daycare home. But Essex County immediately lost 40% of child care availability. And so we've got to walk through this very carefully if we're going to arrive at consensus because the Northeast Kingdom has child care facilities where people are coming and going with no nefarious intent, but they may have a weapon attached to the rack in the back of their pickup truck for whatever reason. And this potentially brings up an ignition point pardon the pun, um, for people who are simply going about their day and it may have a negative impact on what child care availability is left here in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so unless this is really tailored to the building itself and perhaps a, a playground or whatever that's inside some kind of a fenced off area, leaving it vague so that anybody coming into the parking lot is automatically in violation is very problematic for me. Just giving you fair warning. Thank you, Joe. Um, and uh, if, could I just comment on that? Sir? Absolutely. Um, I, I agree with what Joe's saying um, and I don't, Personally, I think the building and the playground area would be um, would be fine. I, I don't, you know, um, I think the people in the Northeast Kingdom right now are dropping their kids off at school, and they are, you know, avoiding coming into conflict with the law in terms of those guns in their car. So I don't I don't think in some uh, practical sense, it would be an issue, but I take Joe's point. And if we have to define it as specifically playground area and building, I would be okay with moving in that direction. 
All right. Um, Eric, if you want to continue the walkthrough. Sure. Um, and the that kind of segues us into, into the hospital definition uh, as we've been talking about that. It does uh, also, just as the child care facility definition did, the cross-reference there, you see it's a hospital as defined in 18 BSA section 1902. That is also the licensing statute. So similar concept to child care facility. If it's a, a hospital that is required to be licensed under Vermont law, then that's where the firearms prohibition would apply. And uh, similar to uh, the uh, language that was used in the child care facility, I'm looking at the hospital language now in section 1902. And it does use the same word place. Hospital means a place devoted primarily to the maintenance operation of diagnostic, diagnostic, et cetera, et cetera, medical terminology after that. But the point is that it uses the word place. Uh, so uh, if I hear the committee correctly, we're, we have to make sure that that language uh, clarifies that it's building only. Yes. Um, it, it might be helpful if, because we don't have access to law books like we do in the, in the, uh, building um, if you provided um, all of those uh, maybe on the committee web page um, the statutes mentioned in this bill like 35 actually they're, they're the commit Peggy posted them this morning so they are oh there. okay she's way ahead of me she's good <laughs> good thank yeah, you Peggy lucky <laughs> if I read this if I read this correctly um, we're almost at the end yeah we got one last definition and, and that's the publicly owned building. You'll see that that uh, uses language that defines it both by, uh, by who, how it's owned and how it's used. So the, you see the publicly owned building uh, that is currently in use for the performance of essential government functions. So it has to be bo both publicly owned and currently in use for the performance of essential government functions. The intent here is, is not to include every you know, potentially empty town shed or government garage or something like that. It must be a building that's actually in use for the performance of government functions. So it's defined by both ownership and use. Uh, should note here that some state statutes that, that prohibit possession of firearms in government buildings sweep much more bro broadly than this and prohibit firearms in any government owned building. Uh, this doesn't do that. It has to be government owned and uh, in use for performance of essential government functions. It's actually similar to, to the federal law, which I also is also on the committee's website. Uh, the federal language provides uh, similarly that, uh, and, and federal law, I should say, uh, prohibits possession of firearms and dangerous weapons in what's known as, they define as federal facilities. And a federal facility is defined as a building or part thereof owned or leased by the federal government where federal employees are regularly present for the purpose of performing their official duties. So you see, that's a similar concept that the federal law takes. It's, it has to be owned by the federal government and federal employees have to be regularly present uh, for the purpose of performing their official duties. So that's a conceptually similar approach that's taken here. Um, yeah. Uh, Joe and question? then Jeanette. Yeah, Joe and then Jeanette. So Eric, uh, the defense attorney in me is kicking in here. And I saw Doug Hoffer on the screen earlier. If Doug Hoffer's building is currently in use by employees, I would say that somebody walking in there with a gun would fall into this definition. But if somebody walks into that same building and there's no employees in there, as a defense attorney, I would be arguing it's not currently in use. Um, I've heard you relate the federal definition and it seems like the federal definition has um, a more clear intent than what we've got written here. Am I wrong? No, I think it, as soon as you mentioned the federal definition right then with your question, I had, a, I had actually, as I was looking at the language here in S30, I thought oh, that word currently, you're correct, it would be better off with the word regularly. And then when I looked at the federal statute that does use the word regularly. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, a, that's you're right, that's a better term. And, and it may be that uh, federal language itself, you might decide is, is uh, better captures the intent of what you're looking at. If you like, I can read it one more time. 
Um, no, I think we got it. Senator okay. White. Yeah, so I have um, a few questions about this and I don't know if they're for um, Eric or for when we discuss it, but first of all, publicly owned, so it has to be owned. So if um, the state offices in Barry are rented from somebody, this wouldn't cover them. <clears throat> and um, it covers all government functions. So that, that it's, so it covers town halls also here, I believe. And things like um, city center, we have government offices there, but they're not owned by the government. And the, I, when I read this, I include in this the town garage because that the plowing of the roads in Putney is an essential government function. Um, that is what they do. And that means that um, those guys that work down there at the garage to go pick up their, um, to start their day can't have their, their rifles in their cars or their trucks when they go to work because that is the, um, although this is the building, they can't have it in the garage. But so I think, I think the definition needs to be a little bit clearer about what, what we mean here. And, um, and, and I guess the question is, does it cover all, all government buildings, all town halls, um, town garages, um, salt sheds, um, because they're all essential government functions, okay. whether, so I just think we need a clear definition. Yeah, I, I think we have to have this in discussion. Okay. Um, I think we're, we're a little bit uh, jumping the gun here um, okay. on this issue because I, at first I have thought we were talking, you know, I'd had, if you, uh, are you finished, Eric? Yeah, I'm all set, thank you. Okay, I know that the effective date is July 1. Um, so if we could not spare this, share the screen and we can go on to our witnesses, but yeah. I want to suggest that at some point, if we get to the markup stage of the bill, we need to deal with these problems that Senator Benning, Senator White, and I, to some extent myself, have identified um, with the proposal. Um, there are concerns. I want to just say that I heard from two uh, statewide elected officials with concerns about threats to their um, in their buildings, they're you know following the January sixth um, insurrection in Washington. So I think that's the genesis of, of people said, "Well, why are you bringing this up? It's not COVID related." But I do believe it is it is related to what's happening nationwide, and. Um, you know, I was watching CBS News this morning, not to give them a lot of credit, but the governor of Michigan was on talking about her experience in Michigan with arms insurrection and the um, alleged attempt to kidnap her and put her on trial for, because they didn't like what she was doing to deal with COVID-19. So I think there's a, a general sense if you're in government right now, that you can be under um, significant, in significant danger and the buildings. And I, the concern I heard was not for the individual office holder, but for their staff and for the people that work for those uh, folks. So, um, and we, we've seen it in Georgia, we've seen it all over. So that's why I'm bringing this up, I've taken up this bill. Um, and, People can argue with me over whether it's COVID related or not COVID related. That's my reason for doing it. So I would now turn it over to our Attorney General, Thomas Donovan, uh, for any comments on the bill and um, whether or not he, um, any comments? Uh, DJ, welcome again. Seems Good like morning. you're a regular here now. <laughs> Happy to be included. Thanks for having me. Um, Good morning, uh, T.J. Donovan, Vermont Attorney General, for the record. Uh, I'll be very brief. I, I support this bill. Uh, this is a common sense approach to 
to public safety, to reasonable uh, gun uh, regulations. I, I think this is needed uh, given what's going on in the world. And it just makes common sense given uh, the, the public uh, spaces that the bill are, are prohibits uh, uh, firearms in. So uh, I support it. Um, it's good public policy. Uh, it makes sense. And uh, people have a right to, to feel safe and not to worry. And this issue of guns intimi and intimidation uh, is real. Uh, and got a call last week from a constituent, not in one of these spaces in the bill, but exactly as Senator Baruth described, um, an argument about a mask and where somebody then lifted up, a, a, I guess, a jacket or a coat and showed a gun. Um, this is real. Um, this makes sense. Uh, it's a good bill. And I thank the Senate Judiciary Committee for, for taking it up and it has my full support. Thank you. Um, do you share the concerns about some of the definitions and will your office yeah. be available to help us to clear, more clearly define some of these concerns? A absolutely. We're always available to help. And I think the questions raised by um, the senators uh, are, are good questions and will make the bill an even better bill. Any questions? Senator Benning has a question. For so, TJ, as your office is looking into this, my defense attorney mechanism is kicking back in. Essential government services. Yeah. Yeah. What's essential, what's not? I mean, I know Doug Hoffer's offices are essential government services. Your offices, eh, I'm not so sure. But there's a grading that is suggested by that language. So yeah, I would hope you guys look into that and figure out if there isn't a better way to define that. I, I think that's a good and, and point. Yes, for, for public edification, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> well, you're not you're not the first to call me non-essential. So <laughs> it was one of my questions too, Joe. Is what what do we mean by essential? Yes. And I think um, Eric was talking about the federal definition, which is regularly used for government services yeah. and. Um, I think another question we have is whether the towns want to be involved. I, I, um, you know, do they want the same protection in their communities uh, as we're proposing here for uh, state? So maybe, maybe in the future on this bill, we should hear from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And we're, we're happy to we're happy to assist in any way in terms of the research that that you may need. Okay. I appreciate that. Any other questions for the Attorney General? Mr. Attorney General, thank you. Congratulations thank you. on your recent re-election. Oh, thank you. Same and to I'll you. I'll say the same thing to Doug Hoffer. Uh, <laughs> Doug, congratulations on your re-election. I'm glad that Senator Benning sees you as an essential function of government as opposed to some others. Um, so please, welcome to the Senate Judiciary and Happy New Year. Thank you, Senator Sears. And uh, Senator Benning, I made a note of that for future reference. <laughs> that, that's, that's good to know. I, I, I'll only pause to note that the chair has not congratulated his committee members for getting reelected. So you're in high ground right now. And I'm sure he was also referring to the treasurer who's also on the screen with us. Well, just to be clear, Senator really Benning, so. um, I'm, I'm pleased that all of you got reelected. I didn't think any of you had as much competition as I did. So I was just as thankful. Uh, again, for the record, Doug Hopper, State Auditor, uh, I too support the bill. And as it happened uh, a week or so ago, when an article came out uh, and mentioned in passing that uh, I, I gather now mistakenly that the State House and courthouses uh, were afforded this protection. I now know that it's a rule of the State House and, and not a statutory prohibition. but. I was curious, so I contacted Jim Condos and I said, isn't that odd that some public officials are protected by this uh, statute or relevant statutes and other public officials and employees are not? And that, that's when he told me of some of the threats he had received and I was concerned. Uh, so I, I expressed that. So um, I think it makes sense. Uh, I, I don't know why it hasn't been done before, but I do have a brief comment about the statutory language. And, and let me say that I have not received any threats to myself or to my staff. Uh, anything is possible. And I would hate to have it happen on my watch that I hadn't stood up for my employees. And 
my concern about the language is your discussion earlier, Senator Sears and, and the rest of the committee about building versus ground. Uh, as you may know, not that any of you have ever been to my building, I don't think, but there are five people who work on the first floor, all of whom thankfully have windows. You can literally walk within two or three feet of every single person that works on the first floor. And a gun is not going to have a problem with a window, period. So uh, this is not about coming into the building and roughing somebody up. Uh, and, and thankfully, it seems to me uh, very unlikely that anybody's ever gonna come to my building, although Jim Condos next door has had some threats uh, with the intent of doing harm. My guess is this would be some person who was particularly angry and upset and, and just got pushed over the edge. But we've seen it happen in Barry uh, and elsewhere around the country. So I just ask you to think about this. I don't know how you would deal with this. It's a challenging question. Uh, it, you, know, you can't stop somebody who's intent on it. You might very well have a big sign that says, don't do that. We have lots of signs that say, don't do things and people do them anyway. But I uh, just want you to know that my concern about my employees uh, starts before people get into the building. They don't have to get into the building to hurt the people who work in my building. Otherwise, I think it's a good bill, good idea. Thank you very much for taking it up. Thank you. Any questions for the auditor of accounts? And again, thanks for being here, Doug. We appreciate it. And uh, look forward. Uh, you know, you're in a position where you're auditing um, different individuals, which may make some of them uncomfortable. Thinking sheriffs, for example, uncomfortable in the past. So, um, I, I, you know, it may not be any threat to any of you right now, but it could, could be. Senator Baruth has a question. Or uh, not, not a question, Mr. Chair, but um, I think some people might listen to the auditor's testimony about the windows, and think that that's uh, over dramatic. But if you remember in 2015, Laura Sobel a DCF worker was hunted down and targeted for the government functions that she was performing. <clears throat> and we would be remiss not to mention her. Um, and at the time there was a general outcry for all state employees that, that they were seeking more protection. So um, I think the, the auditor's point is very uh, on point. Uh, and we looked at, for example, the Springfield uh, state offices um, where there's um, a parking lot that is very poorly lit and was prime for problems. On the other hand, so uh, we'll continue to work on this. Senator White. I do. I um, don't want to sound like I don't agree with this at all, but I do think that um, we need to be really careful about expanding it to um, all perimeters or parking lots or whatever, just because I, I think that um, if somebody really was intent on doing harm to somebody that they don't even need to be in the same parking lot or the same two feet from the window. They, there are um, all kinds of ways to, to shoot somebody if, if that's their intent mm -hmm. by, um, I, I, I'm, I'm just concerned here that if we're, uh, if we get to the point where we're talking about parking lots and then the edges around the parking lots and then I so I don't I don't know here I think we just need to be careful I appreciate what Doug is saying but um, I, I want us to be a little bit careful and by the way well, I do, we, we also uh, have to remember that there are already laws on the books which prevent someone from using a gun to shoot somebody and that's something that is on my mind through this entire conversation. Yeah. Okay. Doug, you had a comment or question? Yeah, real quick. Uh, about a year ago, a little more, after thinking about it for quite some time, I made the decision to ask CGS and ADS to install some heightened security equipment at the building. 
It used to be until then that you could just walk into the building. And I like that. I like that about your building. I like that about state government generally. But I got a little nervous and decided, as I mentioned, to ask them to do it, and they did. So while someone might not come to the building intent on causing harm, they could approach that camera and be told for any number of reasons, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable. Uh, could you call us or you can't come in? I'm not going to let you in. That could really piss them off. And it could lead to something more than was expected or intended. So I realized all of you, you know, this is a big deal. I'm not suggesting that you do it. I, I brought it to your attention because it concerns me because we are so vulnerable visibly and so close to the street, but I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, did somebody else have a question or comment for the auditor? Doug, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, next we'll turn to our state treasurer, Beth Pierce, and I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate her on her re-election since I've been making Good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, and, yeah I, I don't want to single out anyone for non-congratulations. There you Maybe go. Maybe Jim and Kondos, these... since Jim Condos and I worked together for years in the Senate, and he was a senator, yeah. so I might not congratulate him. <laughs> okay. Uh, and all of you as well, in terms of your, um, um, your re-election, uh, and uh, those who've been elected for the first time, thank you very much for your service. You know, I always say you get, uh, you know, these incredible office, you know, great staff, you know, incredible pay, you know, all the perks um, in the legislature, you know, you, uh, you folks work uh, very hard for, you know, for um, uh, not, not a number of great, uh, great things there. So, uh, except for the work. And I appreciate all the work that you do. So I'll leave it at that. Thank um, you. As I tell people, my major perk is a parking space, which is no longer <laughs> I'm not using go. right now. Yeah, there you go. So um, so I, um, I would also support the bill. I think that it's very important. You know, I, I think about our office and the attorney general's office. And I, when I leave sometimes in, in the evening hours, it's a little dark. Um, um, I see that uh, the lights are still on in the AG's office. So, uh, you know, I have some concerns. I guess what I would uh, echo with, uh, with um, Doug is, you know, the windows, not so much, uh, you know, um, I, I don't think it's as much in our office there, but I do get nervous about the parking lot and the proximity. So you might say, you know, I get the hospital when you're parking, you know, and, um, you know, barely in sight of the building. Uh, you know, I've experienced the same thing. Uh, and, uh, but maybe within certain proximity to the building uh, that you might want to consider because uh, it, it can be um, um, uh, a little unsettling. Um, I think that it's very, very important to, um, to, to protect our employees. Obviously, we're all concerned about that. You know, um, our office has uh, a great deal of public uh, um, contact. Uh, we have the retirement division, and folks come in and out for that. We have unclaimed property. And sometimes you have some stress as people are looking at retirement. I do remember uh, many years ago, it was before I was treasurer, and, uh, and I've been treasurer since 2003, uh, that... Um, uh, someone came in and uh, and did have um, a uh, a gun on on his uh, person, uh, and you know that concerns me. Um, you know it can get a little um, tense there. Uh, this is not um, uh, a person entering, but uh, our staff has actually had to uh, counsel two people on the phone that uh, uh, were contemplating suicide. And by the way, uh, they counseled him very well, waited for the police to show up, and it was a, a, a good um, a good outcome. But there are stresses, and uh, I, I get concerned about that uh, um, as, as we, as we um, uh, look to protect employees, whether it's social services. I used to be in, in another state, a um, administrative services officer, and I and had to get um, additional um, uh, security at, at different occasions for social workers who had made some decisions that uh, angered folks. So I think that uh, having those protections uh, for public employees, perhaps, as I said, a, a per perimeter around the building might, might deal with that. I think about daycare as well. And uh, so this isn't my field. So I, I, I apologize. I'm going a little um, off, the, um, off the reservation on that. But you know, um, in terms of the grounds, uh, you know, you can shoot from another area that isn't the playground um, and uh, and put uh, children at risk. So I, I do worry about that as well. And I had one clarifying question, um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, Ledge Council um, uh, 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 clar clarified it, and I just um, got it wrong. But um, 
when you talk about public use, uh, you do have uh, use uh, in facilities that are leased. Um, and I wanted to make sure that they were covered um, as well as uh, facilities that are owned. And uh, it, um, uh, and again, I, th I think that again, parking lots are within certain, certain range of the building might be something you wanna consider. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. I do support the bill. I think, you know, you folks have, uh, Ledge Council has done a great job. There's um, obviously some things that have to be um, clarified and and uh, and working through. That's what you folks do, and you do a great job with that. But I do support the bill. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> one clarifying comment for me: the um, trying to it's always bothered me. In Bennington, we have a state office building. Um, and so everyone that enters that building to go to any state office within that building, except for probation and parole, has to go through a metal detector. So they're protected very well um, as, far, as far as you can in terms of that. But if I go to Springfield to the state office building, there is none. So it's a completely different um, setup. And it, it, it has bothered me that they, um, because there's a courthouse within that building, they get extra protection. And so when you talk about state employees and their, and some of the problems you've seen, it's, when I go into the pavilion, um, I have to go through um, at least uh, check in with security and to get to certain areas of there's more security. So when I go into your office, I get more security than if I go into uh, Doug Hoffer's office or Jim Hundle's office. Oh. So I, I just merely point that out that we already have these inequities within the sure. within the system. Yeah, uh, several years ago, um, uh, Senator, um, I remember the governor's office before the changes that we made, and we have made good changes, I would, um, and I appreciate that, and I think they should be in every building. I think there should be panic buttons, you know, at the reception area, uh, if they're not there already. Um, and, uh, but I do remember that uh, protest has made it all the way up to the governor's office, um, um, uh, when we did not have those uh, those um, uh, provisions, and I and I get concerned about folks again, uh, folks that are on the front lines in particular that have made decisions that uh, uh, don't necessarily, um, um, uh, you know, the person involved, such as social services, may not uh, uh, may not agree with, and and the tragedies that you could have there. The one other comment I did not make, sir, and I'd like to do that is under you know I see that the state you know state house has a rule right now. And that uh, there are, I, I believe he said a hospital is a rule as well. Well, you know, rules don't have the same level of enforcement. You know, if you go in and you've got a, um, um, a gun, uh, they say, leave it, you know, in the car or whatever they might say, you know, you can't take it in here. Um, but, you know, the attempt is more likely when it's a rule and with very, very little consequences. I saw that, you know, the, he, you know, the issue of, um, of, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to look at the, my notes here, but the issue of you know you can you can do um, uh, if they refuse to uh, some you know some type of uh, criminal uh, action, but generally speaking, it's you know you can't bring it in. Uh, the rule is there, but I think it needs more enforcement. And I would agree wholeheartedly, Senator, that we need to make sure that the security in every single building um, is um, is adequate. I think we made improvements in the pavilion um, uh, since that time, um, and. Uh, uh, we need to do that in other buildings and protect our state employees because uh, uh, many of them are at risk in the types of jobs they do, and I think it's important to do that. And the last comment I'll make is I remembered an event as you as I was talking back 12 years, 10 years ago, 12 years ago in Colorado, uh, where somebody made it all the way to the governor's office and uh, and had a gun. And unfortunately, it was a tragic event in terms of the uh, the individual with the gun. Uh, he was shot and uh, and killed. Um, but uh, they made it very, very close to the governor's office. And, you know, I think that a good review of, um, of uh, protections in every office um, in, uh, and uh, department. Uh, some folks work late, by the way, so I think the grounds are important. You know, when I leave the office, as I said, I do see the lights on in the AG's office uh, many, many times. 
and I'm sure the lights are on in the auditor's office as well. Uh, so you got a lot of hardworking state employees, not just us, but uh, um, you know whether it's uh, uh, people in uh, Jim's office that uh, do regulatory work, uh, whether it's social workers. Uh, we need to protect all of our people. So that'll be that's the end of my testimony, sir. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator White. Has a question? No, I just have a comment that um, we have a couple. Um, Bill, well, I don't, they're not bills yet, but um, because government operations deals with state employees, we have a, a whole uh, hearing on safety and security of, of the employees, and that would imply the buildings themselves. So it isn't prohibiting guns or anything, but we're talking about how do we, how do we um, provide safety and security for our employees. So we are taking that up. I appreciate that, Senator, because I think it's uh, very, very important. And, you know, I mentioned some examples, but there are others. And uh, uh, we hate to put our employees at risk for doing a good job, a great job. And uh, thank you again for that, uh, uh, letting me know that. Um, finally, uh, Senator, uh, Secretary Jim Condo, Secretary of State, congratulations on your tough reelection battles. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm glad you made it through. Thanks very much, Senator. <clears throat> it um, wasn't a landslide that you're usually used to. <laughs> <laughs> it was close enough. <laughs> uh, let me just uh, start out by saying that uh, I think the only two statewide constitutional officers that are not uh, protected in this way are the, the auditor's office in my office. Uh, we're both on the complex, but uh, we're outside of the state house. We're outside of the pavilion building. Um, I think we, we've had several instances over the last few years uh, of threats. Uh, we had, and this had nothing to do with elections. We had one, uh, well, actually more than one, uh, where we had to issue, have an, a TRO, temporary restraining order issued uh, because someone had called up, not at our office, but at uh, one of our uh, leased offices and said, uh, told the receptionist, if I were you, I wouldn't be, he was a licensee. And he said, if, if I were you, I wouldn't be in your office tomorrow uh, when I show up. Um, we had, we had, based on number of calls that this person had had with us interactions, we asked for and received a TRO. We also sent the state police down to uh, look, talk to the guy to find out if, if you know, what his intentions were. Um, it really came to the forefront this year. Uh, shortly after the election, we were getting some nasty emails and phone calls uh, prior to the election, but it really ramped up after the election. Uh, I received one text message, in fact, that said I was going to be in handcuffs soon for my role. Uh, that uh, we had voicemails uh, which were reported. Uh, all of this has been reported to uh, uh, both the FBI, U.S. attorneys, and uh, the Department of Public Safety uh, and the VIC. Um, the voicemails that we received, frankly, were, to put it bluntly, vulgar. Um, they were intimidating. Um, they were, I would say at this point, it was considered indirect threats. Uh, but, uh, you know, things like, uh, they're bringing back the firing squad and you should be ready. Um, that type of stuff. Um, I, I think that we've always had some threats, but this really ramped up this year. Uh, and we had quite a few uh, after, after the election, as I said. We also met, administer the Safe at Home program, uh, which is the address confidentiality program. We were the third state in the country to enact it back around 2001, I think. Um, and it's a very important program where anywhere between 150 to 200 individuals are, uh, and it can be men, women, or children, are on that list. It's a protected list. It's it's kept in a uh, safe, um, uh, and they use our address as their legal address, even for voting purposes. 
um, uh, you know, they, they, we know where they live, but the, we, we, and we can forward them their ballot, but uh, uh, it's called a blind ballot. Uh, so that there is no, um, no way to distinguish who it is. Um, we have, we've had several instances where, and just a few years ago, I had a case where um, the person who manages that, that uh, uh, safe at home program uh, called me on the phone and said, hey, I got this guy on the phone who's being pretty uh, abstinent or uh, pretty uh, persistent and wants to uh, wants me to give him the name of a, of a woman and her daughter and where they're located uh, because he wants to do a welfare check. And she said, he says he's law enforcement, but he's in Massachusetts. So I said, fine, send it up to me. So he gets on the phone and he said, basically, I'm in law enforcement in Massachusetts and I understand how these programs work. Uh, it's necessary that I get access to the information that I'm looking for. And I said to him, well, I said, if you're familiar with the program, then you know that I can't give that information out without a court order or law of our state law enforcement uh, approving it. <clears throat> His comment was, okay, I'll send you the court order. Well, after a week, I hadn't received it. He called and I think he thought, <laughs> I think he thought Vermont was a big place because he was shocked when he got a hold of me again. And <laughs> uh, I said to him that I had not received this court order. And he said, well, I've got it right here. I can read it to you. And I said, no, that's not good enough. I need the copy of the court order. Um, something in the call just didn't, didn't register right. And so I called state police. They sent someone down to do a welfare check. And it turns out that this guy was indeed a law enforcement officer from Massachusetts. But the person he was looking for was his estranged wife and daughter. Uh, and he was trying to find them. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we have to deal with out of our office. And, and um, um, I, I'm a, I, I don't own any guns today, but I have in the past, I grew up with guns. Uh, I certainly recognize the right uh, to have guns, uh, but I think we have to be careful when we're um, saying that this building is, is exempt, but this one isn't. So I think there needs to be some consistency. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, and based on what has happened over the last two to three weeks, um, I support the bill. Thank you, Jim. All right, questions for Jim. I'd just like to thank you for bringing up the Save at Home program. I actually remember working with then Secretary of State, then Mark on that bill. Um, came through this committee. I think Senator Nick remembers the work on that bill. It was it was really groundbreaking at the time because we didn't have too many. I think there was only one other state at the time that we were working on it. And it might be somebody that we used to I think first. it was either Oregon or Washington was the only yeah. other states that were yeah. involved. So it was it was uh but I, I'm glad to hear that it's been successful and remains you know an integral part of your your office. We don't often hear much about it. It's nice to hear that. Uh, Senator Benning had a question or comment. So, Jim, I'm hearing your testimony and some thoughts are going through my head. I appreciate the fact that this bill is attempting to protect government employees because I'm one of them. On the other hand, uh, as you're speaking about being careful about what buildings you're trying to protect. There isn't anybody, with the exception of DCF workers, there isn't anybody I can think of that is more subject to potential harm than a divorce attorney from the spouse on the other side. And there is certainly an argument to be made that people in those kinds of situations are in just as much danger as the folks that this bill is trying to address. And I don't know where to draw the lines, but your first comments about who threatened you, were any of those people ever charged with a crime? No, um, they weren't. They, the, um, uh, 
the investigation, I think it's still an open investigation. The FBI has it, U.S. Attorney, as well as uh, the VIC um, and uh, state police. But uh, my understanding is that it has, the wording was just right. You're a lawyer, I'm not. But the wording was just right that they didn't cross the line for a direct threat. But I'm telling you, I, I, I can't give this information out it's not public information, it's confidential uh, because it's under investigation. But I will tell you that if you read these these things and then you see what, what was said at the national level in Congress, I would submit to you that these comments were worse than those comments uh, that, that you saw in, in Congress. And, and uh, uh, it, I, I agree with you, Senator. It's it's a. I don't know where to draw the line. It, you know, we we have a facility uh, that's in rental in lease space uh, in downtown Montpelier. Uh, it, it's it's us and another regulatory agency. Um, uh, you know, there's there's my office just across the street. I'm considered part of the co capital complex, as is uh, the Auditor Hoffer. We're considered part of that the capital complex, and you know what. You know, where do we draw this line? I don't know. I do know the state house is protected, and I know the pavilion is protected. I'm not sure after that. Okay, thanks. Senator Sir. Yeah, I just want to make one comment. That, um, we've been basically talking about in the building. Some people think this bill bans um, firearms at protests, and I don't think this particular bill does. That may be a great idea or a horrible idea, but I want to make clear that that's not what this bill does. It only is if you were to carry the fire. Currently, it's inside the building, um, unless you're protesting a child care facility. Yeah, Senator, I can't think of who was first. Senator White or Senator? Senator White. Um, I, I just was going to say that I think that there's, there's we're, we're con conflating two different issues here and they're, they're kind of related, but they are different issues. We are, we are looking at um, how to provide security and safety for our state employees. And that might be cameras in parking lots. It might be um, having a sheriff's yeah, deputy sure. at the entrance to the building because just the presence sometimes of law enforcement calms things down. It might be, uh, there are different ways to provide security and safety for state employees. And we're looking at that very um, closely around how do we do that and try to do it uniformly. But here we're not, we're talking about something very specific, which is carrying a gun inside of a building. That's, that's what we're talking about here. And it is a protection for, for the employees, but it, I, I believe it goes beyond that. And it isn't just, it's why, why does someone need to carry a gun inside a daycare center or inside the state house? So I, I think that they're, we're, we're getting these two, these issues, although they're related, really um, kind of bottled up here by, by talking about the security of our state employees and the safety of them in all places. And we are dealing with that. So that I just wanted to- Right now, <laughs> yeah, we're hearing from the constitutional officers. And so I, I yeah. think that's part of why we're hearing about state employees. I want to tell you, I'm a frequent visitor at hospitals, emergency rooms um, recently. And uh, I don't understand why someone with, with all the mental health problems that our hospitals are now taking care of in the emergency room and in other parts of their facilities. For me, that's the, if this bill was just about hospitals, um, to me, that's a no brainer. Uh, what's happening, you know, you have, mm -hmm opiates inside your hospital. You have all kinds of things going on. We had somebody shot and killed at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, which obviously many Vermonters use. I, so I want to make clear that our discussions here are not just about state employees. Right. We're about 
dangers within other facilities. Most people thought that child care facilities were covered under when we did the schools, but they were not. And that, so that's why they're included. But I just don't want to have us just focus on state employees here. I think yeah. are bigger than that. Senator Bruce. Uh, yeah, I, I want to second what uh, you both just said, Senator White and Senator Sears. I did also want to stress something, which is without, without um, you know, putting it too much on national politics, I do want to say that over the last number of years, you had the President of the United States um, broadly encouraging groups that uh, see themselves as in opposition to government, um, encouraging them to, to go forward and assert their, um, their will, which translated into people going into state houses, taking over state houses, uh, ultimately plotting against government officials. I think when, uh, when um, Secretary Condos uh, talks about these threats getting more <clears throat> intense in the last couple of years, that's part of what we're seeing is a radicalization that has been, in a sense, top down and produced via the internet. So um, that's one of the reasons why I think it's more common now to turn on your TV and see that people have gone to a government installation to try to intimidate or pressure an arm of government to do or not do something. Um, and again, that's why I take uh, Joe's point about threats in his profession. I'm a teacher on a college campus. There are threats in my profession too. My first cell phone was because I had a student writing uh, short stories in which I was brutally murdered. Um, and so there was a SWAT team put together to protect me from this person. And I was given my first cell phone. So there are threats everywhere in our society. Some of them come from firearms, but this bill was crafted very, very narrowly to try to produce common agreement in the House and the Senate. Um, and so I, I would go back to that. Um, intention. Thank you. And Senator Benning has a comment and Senator Nick. I just and wanted I, to are they answer. I, I want to make one. If we're done with, with Secretary Condos, we might want to let him. Right now, he's the witness. And so we're kind of talking around him. So I don't want to. The, the conversation is fine. I just. Are, are they for Senator Con, uh, Senator? They, they were not. Okay. No. I, I Jim, just thank wanted... you so much for your testimony. You're welcome. Appreciate, appreciate it very much. Thanks for being here. Senator Benning. I just want to say first, I appreciate this conversation. It is it's a conversation that needs to be fleshed out as much as possible. Jeanette, when you asked the question, why do they need to be in X building? From my perspective, I don't see that as the fulcrum. Yeah. There is a place where you have to start from when you make an argument. And in my case, I start with the fact that it's a constitutional right. They may not need to have a gun in a given place, but they actually have a constitutional right to have one. And when you move to put any kind of conditions on that, I begin to get very leery that we are on a whack-a-mole mission that eventually leads to complete erosion of that right. And I'm not suggesting that this is a, an exclusive um, attempt to do that, but I am very cautious when we use the start point for the conversation, why do they need to have yeah. it here or there? So I, not know, as good. I, yeah. I, I come back and say that I appreciate this conversation. I think it's a great one to have. You're right. I'm muted. Senator Nitka. So I just would like to say, I'm certainly concerned about um, some of the facilities, but more so on the issue of buildings and looking at that and what that would mean. I mean, we really need to take a look at this carefully. I think of truck drivers on the interstate who sleep um, in their trucks, are parked there, 
uh, and wherever they are parked are subject to robberies frequently. And many of them carry a gun on their person. And of course they'd be going into the um, rest area to use the facility. And I don't think, you know, they're from all kinds of states where things may be different. And I don't think we're gonna have signs at the border saying, if you go in a rest area, you can't, you can't have your gun on your person. I mean, I think there's a lot of things we need to look at carefully when we're talking about buildings and what it means. So just to, I, I agree with Jeanette, the town garage and all those things. You just need to look at this carefully. Well, I, I think when we say government building, yeah, I agree we need to look at it carefully. On the other hand, again, going back to my hospital, mm -hmm. um, I, you can't have, have tobacco either. <laughs> um, it's a it's a tobacco. It, the sign says tobacco free campus and and to, and firearm free campus. So um, they've made pretty clear uh, their intent is to have neither on the grounds. Um, so I, and I, every time I see the sign when I walk into the state house, no firearms beyond this point. I somewhat chuckle to myself: is how are we going to enforce it? They're certainly, they're certainly- Because you and I both know colleagues who have carried firearms yes. in yep. the state house and, used, and haven't used them luckily. But, um, right. Um, I remember sitting across from one in finance where we're dealing with Act 60 and wondered what would happen if I really- um, Times were different. <laughs> they were, but um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't open, but it was certainly right. clear. Right underway. So I just wanted to respond to Joe. I, I realized that and when I was trying to think of that, that wasn't, it didn't come out right. But I, I just wanted to make the differentiation here between this bill and uh, protecting the safety and security of our, of our employees, which is, can be very different than just carrying a gun. I mean, it, they're two different issues, although they're related. And I just didn't want us to get so far into the weeds about protecting uh, the security of our employees that we lost sight of what this bill is really about. I appreciate that, Jeanette. And I think if, if we're gonna be able to reach consensus on this, we have to be clear and very specific <clears throat> about the reasons behind each mm -hmm. section of it and what it's attempting to do because there's lots of people out there already arguing that we're on a mission for an overall attack on the Second Amendment and the 16th Article of the Vermont Constitution. Um, so if we're going to arrive at consensus, we've got to be very clear, very specific and direct on why each facility we're trying to protect needs that protection in a way that to some people will be overriding their constitutional right. But Again, I want to point out that in Bennington, it's different than other state office buildings where if I want to go to the um, Economic Services Office of Department of uh, Children and Families or to the uh, Unemployment Office of the Department of Labor, I, I have to go through a metal detector in Bennington. And if I went to the same offices in Springfield or other town, other communities. I don't have to. So there is already kind of a incongruity there uh, where certain uh, state offices are more protected than others. All right. Any, it, it will be the saddest day in my life when we get to the point where I know I think we're going, when the doors of our state house become an armed obstacle to anybody wanting to come in the doors. And I know that's the direction we're moving in, but that is such a, a historical mark in time for me that I feel like I've got to analyze everything I possibly can um, from a perspective of what are we giving up in the long term in order to make protections in the short term. As chair of the Senate of the Senate Institutions Committee, you'd certainly have quite the voice in that. Senator Baruch. Uh, just to respond to what Joe just said, um, I view this bill as allowing us to continue our tradition of not having armed guards at the doors or metal detectors. I think this is a very 
uh, limited common sense way of saying, look, to everybody, we want this to be the people's house where everybody can discuss very problematic and hot button issues without having to worry for their safety. So it doesn't arm anybody, it tries to disarm people to keep the state house open and free. Um, and I just want to say, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm delighted with this discussion. Uh, I'm, none of this is written in stone and I'm pleased to hear Joe talk about consensus because that would be uh, my, my hope is that the five of us could reach agreement on a bill. Well, it would be good. Um, so what I'm gonna do is use my executive authority and take a break until 20 minutes of 11. So uh, that will get us online to be finished by 11.45. Um, so why don't we take a break until, again, uh, 10.35. All right, our first, um, by the way, um, tomorrow, do we have, um, we have John Campbell next, but is he online? John's here, yeah. so yeah. Uh, John Campbell is next on the witness list that I have. So uh, John is representing the Vermont State's Attorneys and Sheriff's Department. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senators. And um, we uh, wholeheartedly support the bill. Uh, I think there's a couple of issues that when you do go into uh, redrafting um, that you should uh, definitely address. Um, you know, one of the first ones is the uh, an issue that actually we've spoken about in the past when, when we've had similar discussions, and that is uh, the knowing uh, the uh, issue of whether the person knowingly uh, possesses um, the firearm. Uh, so I, I, in this uh, uh, this version, you do not have that. Whereas if you look at the uh, at 40, uh, 4004, I believe it is, um, involving uh, possessing of the firearms on school property, uh, you'll see that it's, uh, there's a knowing standard there. So uh, that's something you, I think you should definitely um, uh, take a look at. The second one, uh, again, you've, many of you have already identified, and that is the definition of the, what a public building is. Um, frankly, I think it's extremely vague the way you know, where essential government functions um, occur. Uh, I think that you're going to probably have to come up with something if, uh, a little different because uh, if you actually even if you look at it, uh, doing some research on it, you'll see that it's often discussed in some cases where it is a, a vague definition and often given open to uh, several different interpretations. So uh, being that it would be very difficult for uh, for us to prosecute. Um, and also one of the things I, I think uh, Senator White identified this is uh, initially is that uh, there are a lot of leased buildings. And in fact, um, the uh, state's attorneys, we have seven of our buildings are, are leased from, from private uh, entities. So uh, if you're trying to cover that, you're probably gonna have to deal some, somehow with uh, that issue. Um, overall, I think if, if you go back, if you look at the, um, at the language from the school bill, you'll probably have a really good foundation in which to uh, work this. And uh, especially if you, uh, want to deal with it with uh, if it's, there's a intent to go in to harm somebody into one of these buildings, uh, you, you know that is dealt with in the in the in the 4004. So you might want to look at that. Um, in closing, I think it's really a good bill because you know nowadays we are in a very tumultuous time. Um, you know, and, and one of the other things that hasn't been brought up that, that I think should be is the fact that. Um, by doing this, in, especially in public buildings or in hospitals um, and daycare centers, you're going to avoid confusion because a lot of times, you know, if a law enforcement officer is called to a scene on something and you have people who have, you know, weapons out or weapons on their side, there, there could either be a confusion that you definitely do not want to, um, uh, to find yourself in that position. So I think it's uh, Overall, it's a, it's a very good bill. Um, I, I, I laud the senators for um, uh, introducing it and I uh, wish it the best of luck. I appreciate your bringing up the knowing standard because I was absolutely thinking back to an experience I had about a year ago going through TSA. And uh, I had my um, money clip uh, on me and I forgot there was a knife in the money clip. Mm -hmm. a short little thing, but TSA picked it up and took the money clip. So I, um, 
I lost my money clip, but but I certainly had no knowledge that I was carrying a knife on an airplane. Uh, mm-hmm. and it, obviously, it was only still. Uh, the point is that I I didn't intend to take a knife. That's a good good idea, and um, I think I. Have there been any prosecutions that you're familiar with um, for violating on the uh, schools or courts? I, I know, not that I know of, but um, uh, I tell you, we haven't been short on threats, though, especially lately. You know, we've uh, we've had several of our um, several of our deputy state attorneys and one of the essays that have been uh, physically threatened, um, which you know is on uh, one of them is under current investigation. Or the uh, the individuals being curr- is currently being investigated, uh, but I'll I'll check and see if we've had some. I, I I'd have to I didn't have a chance to to uh, uh, poll the uh, the sitting uh, state's attorneys, but I'll if check you could, it. I, it would be helpful to know if there's been any prosecutions and any difficulties they've had with the current laws regarding either schools or uh, courthouses. I know that um, that uh, about two years ago I went over to the Supreme Court. And Justice Rye, uh, Chief Justice Ryber and Justice Eaton, I met with them about courthouse security. And it was amazing the stuff that they've uh, taken off of people coming into courtrooms. Uh, yeah, the, in fact, actually, I don't know if you've seen their collection, but it, um, <clears throat> you, all you have to do is go to the surplus, uh, you know, in, in Middlesex. They have literally a, an entire box full of every kind of knife you can think of. Um, you know, they have the, you know, the throwing stars, they've had, you know, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the brass knuckles. And they, it's amazing how, what people come in. In fact, one of the, you know, the, uh, the craziest things is, are the people who come in um, with drugs on them. You know, we've had people come in with packets of heroin, uh, you know, cocaine, uh, everything you can think of. Uh, like, you know, I think I forgot to leave my cocaine home today. Uh, so so uh, it never ceases to amaze me, the uh, intellectual uh, ability or capability or capacity of some of these individuals. But Any questions for Executive Director Campbell? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank much. you very much, John. Bye bye now. Bye now. Um, our next witness is uh, Matthew Valerio, the Defender General. Good morning. Good morning, Matt. Thank you for having me. I. This is an area of the soup I tend not to dip my toe into. Um, have not traditionally. Uh, testified on gun-related legislation. Um, This one had a couple of nuances to it that I guess warranted some discussion and I figured I would take a look at it. Um, And you asked, so I'll give you an opinion. Um, The uh, one of the things that I, I think we have to look at is the context of what we what we are dealing with. And I did some research on this over the last couple of days. Um, the estimate is that there are 393 million civilian owned firearms in the United States. Um, and that's enough for one, one for every man, woman and child in the nation and still have 67 million guns left over. Um, and that's a stat from the Graduate Institute of International Development. Um, And uh, I looked at a couple of different areas and some have plus or minus 20 million on either side. Bottom line is we have a lot of guns out there. Um, And uh, oddly enough, and and I don't know how, why this is the case. And I think, I actually think part of it is that uh, um, Vermont doesn't have uh, the same sort of registration requirements for firearms, Vermont is ranked very low for the number of registered firearms in the nation, um, anywhere from 47th to 50th, depending upon which list you look at. Um, but the the biggest issue is that there's there are so many unregistered firearms in the nation as a whole and in Vermont um, that nobody has a real handle on how many are actually out there. 
when I look at any kind of pr new proposed criminal justice um, initiative, and particularly one that creates a new crime, I look at it in three different ways. Number one, are there any constitutional rights that are implicated by the proposed criminal law? Number two, are there current laws on the books that cover the activity that is sought to be prohibited? Um, number three, will the activity that is sought to be prohibited um, achieve the purpose of the bill? And the fourth thing is, and I look at this in every situation, will the bill make things worse for anyone um, inadvertently sought to be, who are sought to be protected by the bill. And this one is, uh, this is what I've come up with. Um, obviously there are second amendment and Vermont article 16 issues that arise whenever you start talking about firearms in Vermont, but I don't see them as a, as an impediment to the sort of regulation that is sought here. I do um, in general, have a concern for the erosion of uh, the, these constitutional rights, just as I would for any constitutional right. I don't think you can pick and choose, uh, you know, that you, you know, you like the First Amendment better than you like the Second Amendment, um, and you may well, uh, but as long as they're both uh, the, the, the chief law of the land, you've got to embrace them all. Um, Nevertheless, in this particular instance, I don't see either one of these as an impediment to making this sort of limitation on those rights uh, because the rights are not um, carte blanche um, that you can possess a firearm anywhere you anywhere in any way you want to. Um, where I start to bog down on this is with the other questions that I ask and then with some of the um, research that I've done outside of, um, outside of the books. And I, I want to tell you in advance that my wife is a director of a preschool and daycare in um, Proctor, Vermont, that has 50 plus kids in it um, every day. Um, and uh, uh, whether, it, you know, not just during the school year, but, but all year round. Um, and uh, that informs some of my opinions as well, because my wife likes to inform my opinions, I uh, <laughs> might imagine. Um, so are the, question, the second question I ask is there, are there current laws on the books that cover the activity that's sought to be prohibited here? And I think there are. Um, if you recall, just a couple of years ago, um, the legislature updated 13 VSA um, 4003, 4003, carrying dangerous weapons. Um, a person who carries a dangerous weapon or a deadly weapon with the intent to injure another shall be imprisoned for not more than two years and fined not more than 2,000. Um, and uh, it, it can be a 10 year uh, felony if that person intends to harm multiple persons. Uh, in my view, the in, in just kind of looking this at this in space, it if it, it's not the carrying of a firearm that's the problem, it's the intent and the and desire of the person carrying the firearm that is the problem. You know, if uh, uh, and uh, four thousand uh, thirteen VSA forty oh three um, seems to hit that nail on the head. Of course, Vermont has also has a long standing. Uh, reckless endangerment statute under 13 VSA 1025, where a person who recklessly get, engages in conduct which places or may place another person in danger of death or serious bodily injury um, shall be imprisoned for not more than a year or fine a thousand dollars. Recklessness is and, and danger is presumed with where the person knowingly points a firearm in the direction of another, whether the firearm is loaded or not. And that is activity that is um, obviously more severe than merely carrying a firearm, but it depends upon the conduct of the person who, who has the firearm. Um, 4003, however, 
talks about the person and whether they do anything or not, what their intent is. Um, and you have to divine that intent from the totality of the circumstances that are, um, that are present. There are other lesser, um, you know, fine, just fine only type uh, um, prohibitions on, on firearms that, uh, um, that are also, and we've talked about the ones involving schools and the like, um, but these seem to apply to every place. Um, and so uh, I, I bring them up. The next question is also one where I tend to get a little bogged down, which is, will the activity that's sought to be prohibited achieve the purported purpose of the bill? Um, probably not. Um, the person who wants to use a firearm or carry a firearm to cause a problem in a um, preschool, daycare, government building, or hospital is not going to be deterred by the law, um, just as they aren't... Um, you know, no, in the in the Sobel case, when uh, you know, it, it, if you're not deterred by a, a life in prison uh, situation, you are not going to be deterred from carrying a weapon. The bottom line is that these statutes for the individuals who seek to cause problems for people. Um, probably do not deter, and actually there's no evidence that they do deter the conduct um, that is sought to be prohibited. Um, the other, the next question is, will the bill make things worse for anybody who sought to be protected? Because some of these things, they, they get passed and they don't really do anything, but they don't harm anybody um, either. And uh, they make a statement that's important to make, and we go with that. Um, you know, one of the comments that uh, came up in, in, uh, in uh, trying to figure this out is, you know, are the only people who without the ability to respond to threat at a daycare the, or government building or hospital are the people who, who end up working there uh, because they don't have the ability to defend themselves. Um, one of the things that that uh, um, in speaking to my wife about the daycare and preschool situations is some of the issues that have already been brought up here about the, the what about the pick up and drop off area? What about when they're picking up their kid at the playground? What, if, what about um, you know, the general area of the, of the building? Um, and again, I think Senator Benning brings up the uh, appropriate issue, which is that there are many individuals who have a firearm in a, in a rack in their vehicle or um, in the glove box of their vehicle or the like and come to pick up, uh, pick up their kids at daycare um, and they get them at the playgrounds or they get them at the, you know, picking them up at the preschool, um, that sort of thing. And that was a, another, an issue that was brought up uh, so how you define these areas um, is one way of looking at it. And the other way I think of looking at it is whether or not the firearm is loaded. Um, and uh, you might look at this in terms of um, that you shall not possess a, a loaded firearm at a prohibited location. Um, the... One of the other issues that brought up was brought up when I was discussing this with a number of different people is concerns about those who are licensed, um, like ar licensed armed private investigators, for example, who do work for the Defender General's office. We don't have anybody who is a, I don't believe we have anybody anymore who is on staff, who is a licensed armed private investigator, but the Defender General's office routinely uses um, individuals who are licensed armed um, through the Secretary of State's office. Um, and they have to go through a bunch of training. It's not easy to get, um, it's very easy to get a, a, 
uh, you know, obviously for an individual to get a firearm if they want to, but it's not easy at all to become a licensed armed private investigator. Um, and their concerns about their, you know, they have their, some have their weapons on them all the time, just like law enforcement would, and um, perhaps go in and out of courthouses and, and, uh, and the like, uh, doing whatever business they do, or other government uh, buildings. And that came up as a, uh, an issue as well. Um, one of the things that informs my testimony to some degree is that I was on Governor Scott's Violence Prevention Task Force a few years ago. Um, and one of the things that became pretty well recognized when you're talking about actual safety, um, more criminal laws and prohibitions on weapons were not going to be the way to increase um, public safety. And much of that report focused on preparations um, and responses and preparations. They talked about preparations and security in buildings, um, talked about preparing and, and to be able to escape in the event of a, uh, an armed threat. Um, also talked about preparation to be able to defend yourself in the event of an armed threat. Um, and then preparing what to do if you can't escape or defend yourself, um, the ability to shelter in place in uh, particular areas um, that might be secure. Um, and then the more general areas of prevention um, relative to uh, um, intelligence information, um, recognizing who the threats might be, um, working with the mental health um, system to identify um, into it, individuals who might be a threat to themselves or others and getting them the appropriate treatment um, and also understanding that you can't discover um, every threat. And so your preparation as far as security, escape, uh, defense, and shelter in place um, are important things to be able to develop. Um, within state government, uh, my office has uh, multiple levels of security, um, similar to the, to the attorney general's office. Basically, you have to be buzzed in with a card or through the camera um, with, with someone at the, at the front desk. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we've had at various times threats and uh, um, actual attacks and of public defenders across the state. Um, and so this is not something that we are, um, that we're Im immune to or unfamiliar with. Mr. Bruce has a question. Uh, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> I appreciate your comments. Um, am, I, am I wrong or am I misunderstanding you, but couldn't the places where you get bogged down, as you put it, wouldn't, wouldn't that also apply to the prohibition in courthouses? All yeah. of those objections. Yes. Okay. The difference, um, the difference at, at those places, and one of the things that I did note, and I, I actually wrote it in a different spot here, and I didn't say it, but some of these places, like, like courthouses um, and even the state house, um, there is armed law enforcement present um, to be able to respond to um, any a threat. Now, it may not be sufficient. Um, and it might not, you know, it may not be effective, but like at a daycare, you're not going to have, um, you know, armed security present um, where at the state house and at uh, um, courthouses. Um, and, I, and I do know that there's also security at, uh, obviously at hospitals, but I actually just don't know whether or not they are armed um, to be able to respond to a threat. But, but in general, what I mean is, um... You talked about the the idea that it wouldn't stop someone who was intent on doing harm. Um, it would. There were other laws that, uh, in your mind, cover it. That would be the same as in courthouses. Um, so, I the the reason why I um, I am commenting is that it seems like you're you're 
view of what the intent of the bill is is different than mine. So my intent is not um, to provide 100% certainty that these places never again have a gun come into them. I understand it would fail in that sense. But as it stands now, if someone carries a gun into a hospital or if they carry a gun into a childcare center and someone sees the gun and asks them to leave, there's, they have no recourse. A, a police officer can't get rid of that gun. Um, and the person can stand on their rights to have the gun in the environment. Um, that can happen in a courthouse because we've prohibited it by statute. Same with a school. You can't stand on your right to have a gun in the school. So part of the idea is preventing people from bringing it in. The other half of it is once you've determined that somebody has a gun on that property, the statute, if we passed it, would give them the right to escort that person off the property. And then obviously there are questions about how and when or if you could prosecute them, but you would be able to, a, a law enforcement officer could get them out. Um, I think it was Doug Hoffer mentioned, oh no, it was Eric Fitzpatrick, mentioned that he had discussed with Chief Romy what would you do if somebody had a gun in the state house? I've asked Chief Romy as well. And what he says is I would try to reason with that person. But if someone is standing on their, their right to have a gun in the building, um, reason may not well work. So that's, that's why the bill comes forward. Um, so I, I do think um, personally that other statutes don't cover this and that the intent is a bit different from some of the things you're, you're, uh, you're objecting to. I guess the question I have is whether or not you could get to the same thing without creating a new crime. You know, can you, can you make a civil prohibition that would allow law enforcement to say, look, you gotta get that gun out of here and, uh, and give the law enforcement the right to escort the person from the building, even if they haven't, uh, um, have uh, um, voiced some intent to do harm or given any sort of indication that they were going to do harm to anybody. Um, and by the way, I'm, I, at the end of my testimony, I basically was going to say, I'm not taking really any position on the bill. What I'm doing is raising issues for you to consider in, uh, um, what you do going forward. Uh, you know, there are, you know, I understand that there are times to pass bills that uh, um, in and of themselves aren't going to have a major effect on, on anything. Um, and these might be some of those times. Thank you, Matt. There's a question from Matt. Senator Benning and then Senator White. Um, first, a comment. I, if we are passing this bill because people are intimidated, that opens up an unending list of potential places where intimidation alone brings in similar statutory moves. And I think the overall intent of the bill is to make sure no actual violence occurs in these locations. I don't want to get onto the slippery slope of saying somebody, because they're intimidated by the mere presence of a weapon, um, that's rationale for us to pass legislation like this. It would just be an unending list uh, where people happen to be, if they're intimidated, we whack them all in new legislation. Uh, Matt, I, I have a request specifically from you. You were reading your analysis. I think there were four or possibly five sentences. And I was very struck by that, not just for this bill, but for all legislation I'd like to consider in the future. I'm wondering if you have that written down and can you uh, send it to us? There, I believe there were four, possibly five sentences and I wasn't able to write fast enough as you were testifying. I don't know if you've got them written down, but I'd like to have a copy. Um. I have them really just in note form for me. I don't have them in any kind of presentation form, but uh, 
if you want, I can um, probably clean it up and get it to you. I'd really like to have that. Thanks. Senator White. So um, <clears throat> two things. First of all, I just, um, uh, our chief is Romeo, like Romeo instead, oh. but it's Romeo. I. Yeah. Just, just a correction there. And then um, what, Matt, what were you, um, I didn't get your last um, suggestion here about creating a civil prohibition. And I, I don't, I, I don't know how that works. I don't know the well, you all would... you would do is say that it's a, a civil violation to do this um, and you attach a fine to it as opposed to making it a crime. Oh. Uh, and uh, so it's a prohibited activity, which would allow the law enforcement to remove the person from the, from the premises with the, with the firearm, um, as opposed to charging them with a criminal offense for the mere possession of the weapon. So is like a speeding ticket is a civil um, prohibition, right? Correct. I mean, up to a certain point. In fact, um, and I have to, excuse me if I, I was going through, uh, there's actually under, and I, we have all kinds of these, these spotty gun prohibition type statutes and uh, 13 BSA, 4011 um, is a uh, um, hey Roy. That's a fine, well. There, that's a fine only. That's not a. Uh, Don Campbell, you you might want to mute yourself. Thank you. Anyway, you can you can create a civil offense um, as opposed to a criminal offense. Um, you know, a civil violation. Um, and you might even express intent that uh, uh, the legislative intent is to, you know, keep the guns out of the, um, these particular places um, and that law enforcement could escort somebody, you know, out that kind of thing uh, without creating a crime. Um, to me, the crime is the intent to do harm to somebody, not the person who inadvertently has a, uh, um, or even purposefully, but with no ill intent, shows up and is trying to do business. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. Can I can I just ask quickly, in terms of the courthouse prohibition, that that is a statutory crime. You know, in the in the old days, it used to be that uh, it was by order of the. Uh, presiding judge because the judge has the right to control the courthouse and i i think it's and i, I think uh ledge council think, told me that was eric are you uh listening yeah yeah it's a it's a crime under the statute that matt referenced okay um so i i guess what i'm saying is i i think you know, often uh, gun rights people talk about creating a patchwork of confusing laws. And I think if we were to make some prohibitions on locations civil and some criminal, we would go down that path toward, um, first of all, weakening this bill in a substantial way, but second of all, creating, for reasons I don't really understand, a distinction between a prohibition going into a courthouse where you spend a great deal of your time and are protected by that statute uh, and a hospital or um, a government building like the state house where we spend our time. So I, I would favor keeping them all at the, at the statutory level if we, if we, if we do this. I, I don't think it would help to, um, to weaken it to that extent. So that's more a comment really than a, than a question. Well, I'm not, I'm not against uh, changing the courthouse prohibition to a civil violation. Well, your your logic would, if you applied all of your logic, that's where we would go, right? Because that statute in your mind is, is unnecessary and ineffective. I think you're right. You know, the courthouse does screen people with metal detectors and 
armed law enforcement at the entry points um, of each side. No, but they do that based on their statutory authority to do so. Yeah, and they also have inherent authority to control the courthouse um, based upon administrative order and rule, which is constitutionally based. So, you know, the, b before there was ever a statute to uh, uh, prohibit uh, firearms in the court courthouse, the courts or deadly weapons, knives, anything else, there were um, the presiding judge would issue uh, an executive an, a an, an order that says that none of these things are prohibited here, and the violation would be contempt of court. So, you know, I I understand uh, where you're going with this, and I and it uh, I'm just bringing up some issues that uh, uh, to uh, consider going forward. Um, I don't have strong feelings about this, um, but I think that there are defensible positions that have not been heard from other witnesses that uh, um, are worth considering. Could I ask Senator Sears? Yeah, go ahead. So I, I, I'm trying to um, look at the difference here between a crime and a civil offense. And both are, are um, enforceable. And so whether it was a civil offense or a crime to bring a firearm into these places, they could, it could be enforced and the person could be removed, but the, the penalty is different. Is, is that right? Yeah, with a civil offense, there's no ability for uh, jail time or probation. Right, but there's it's there's a f potential fine, and there is a um, the fine could be a thousand dollars, but there was it yeah ten thousand dollars. It doesn't. <laughs> you can have s big civil fines. They they right, uh, right. But so the the real difference here that, is no, but the real difference is the the jail time. Right, jail time. Or but they're both jail. enforceable. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. Um, no. Okay, Joe, just a quick question. 4003, was that in Title 13? Yes. Thank you. Other questions for Matt? Matt, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony and the clarity. Um, it does seem to have muddied some waters, but other than that, that's what I do. Testimony. That's, uh, well, it's what you do. Yeah. That's what he does. Appreciate that. Uh, Judge Grierson is next on our list. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, Judge. And uh, thank the committee for inviting me to uh, this, testify on this bill. Um, this bill, uh, in, a, in essence, creating a new crime. As the committee knows, the judiciary uh, does not take a position uh, on policy issues. And this clearly would be a policy decision by, by the committee, by the legislature. What I do testify uh, or offer testimony on is any potential impact on the courts if this uh, bill were enacted. And it's, if the bill was enacted, I do not see any uh, impact on the court, uh, on the court process. I think what's interesting, obviously, the, the, the judiciary does not own um, any of the buildings they occupy. They're either state-owned or uh, each of the counties has a county courthouse that would fall under uh, the provisions of this bill. Um, and I think one of the questions um, that came up uh, in earlier uh, testimony earlier this morning uh, was the issue of, um, does it apply just to the building itself, the courthouse itself, or the uh, exterior, the grounds and the parking lots. And as I was listening to that testimony, I was trying to recall um, visiting uh, at one point or another, all of the courts, and obviously they all have uh, uh, parking lots adjoining them, some large, some small, uh, some related only to the business of the court, but in uh, mm -hmm. many of the courthouses, um, for instance, in, in Barrie, uh, one of the nearest ones. The other uh, 
folks occupy that building. The, the parking lot itself is relatively small. It's right, obviously, adjacent to the, the rear of the courthouse um, uh, and where uh, folks in, in custody are brought in uh, to the courthouse through that parking lot. Um, but that parking lot, as many of them, are, are restricted either to um, courthouse employees, judges, employees, uh, and or um, folks who occupy the building. So I think one of the questions the, the uh, committee needs to give thought to is whether or not this bill, to what extent uh, this bill would also apply to uh, grounds immediately adjacent um, to the courthouses and specifically the parking, uh, the parking areas. Um, someone mentioned uh, Laura Sobel's case. And of course, um, I'm mindful also of, of Matt's uh, comments with respect to uh, deterrence or the lack of deterrence. Um, she was um, killed in, in a parking lot. It was in the building across the street from the courthouse uh, where DCF at the time had their uh, offices. Um, the DCF has now moved into the, the return to the courthouse. Uh, so these issues um, relate to any number of uh, occupiers of the courthouse. So I just ask the committee to uh, give thought to uh, including uh, the grounds or the parking lots uh, as they relate to courthouse. <clears throat> But beyond that, as I said, the court doesn't take a position either in opposition to or supporting this bill. Thank you. Senator Benning. Judge, would you agree with Matt's um, thoughts about 13 VSA 4003 already covering the activity that we're talking about? I took a, another look at it while he was testifying in it may cover the activity, not necessarily. I mean, this bill seems to be directed to place. Um, yeah, this is so, a location bill. And right. it seems to me to dovetail or overlap with that statute. I think to the extent that it, it prohibits, that statute prohibits uh, uh, firearms, it does. Uh, the, the question obviously before the committee is, do we extend that to specific places? So my, my last question is most important, having built a lot of model ships when I was a kid, what's that model ship over your shoulder? <laughs> it's a... Uh... <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be that much work to figure it out. Well, no, it's been a long time since I looked at it. It's an old Spanish galleon uh, from 1780. Um, okay. Thanks. Don't remember where I got it or exactly why, but it's a great looking piece, and so that's why it's up there. It is. But can Thanks. I can I say a question is out of line? Would that be permissible? <laughs> yeah. You a, no, you can object, committee? Senator. Yeah. You can I object. Can object to that yes. question. Yes, you should have objected. And, yes. will be and, I, and I would have sustained that objection. I think it's called uh, point of order. Uh, uh, point of order. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Benning, are there any other questions from Senator? The Benning? committee will disregard the galleon. Uh, all right. Um, it, but it, it is wouldn't be the first time the know. committee's disregarded me. <laughs> it is interesting to note what people have behind them. And I, I will note that uh, uh, there's all kinds of uh, things. And I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with the curtains and the books and other things behind people. Um, and some of the views that some of our witnesses have are excellent views. But getting back to S30, um, you, you're probably familiar with all the different um, things that have been picked up in our courtrooms. Uh, yes, I've seen that display. Um, and generally, no charges are brought, correct? It's just confiscating the They item. confiscate, right. Gen generally, uh, I'm not have aware been, of any. Yeah, have there been any, do you know, of charges brought? And Not that jumped to mind, uh, Senator. I've seen that collection, and there have been some pretty amazing articles that people yeah, I, try to bring in, but I don't believe they're confiscated at the front, um, front door, um, and I'm not aware of any. I can... 
I can double check, but I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, if we could find out just if there's been any prosecutions sure. under any of the current laws regarding schools as well as um, courthouses. Senator White has a question and comment. Thank you. And I apologize for um, the collapse of my iPad here. And I, so I may have missed, um, Judge, when you, you may have addressed this already. Um, <clears throat> would you just comment on what you see as the difference here, advantages or disadvantages of civil versus criminal? Well, I don't know in, what in this can, issue. I, I don't know if you can put it in terms of advantages or disadvantages. It's just it, it, one is there a different approach to mm -hmm. this issue. And um, I, I think apart from my opinion of that, I would think what you would want to inquire is uh, with law enforcement um, because they're the ones that would, if it's a civil remedy and they would have, depends what authority they have. For instance, someone coming into the state house, um, I, I think was an example someone gave if, if uh, the uh, chief, uh, chief Romeo had the authority to go to someone and say, uh, you can't bring that in here. Then the question is to what extent can they take action uh, civil or otherwise. So I think the, the question is is a good one, Senator, probably more appropriate for law enforcement to their reaction um, as to how they would uh, respond to that. In terms of our enforcement, of course, uh, if it's a, an offense, it's brought by the state's attorney. If it's civil, um, if someone might have the authority to bring it in either as purely civil context or a ticket, uh, if it would go to the JB. So it's just a question on our end uh, uh, on how is that particular law enforced? I think the real question is what authority uh, would the, uh, the enforcement folks have to follow through? What, what, what is the extent of their authority? Thank you. Ho hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Judge. Um, Stay tuned and uh, we'll continue our work on this bill. Thank you. Probably next week or the week after. Uh, Chris Bradley is our next and final witness for this morning. <clears throat> and I want to add that if people would like to testify on this bill, to either contact myself or um, uh, Peggy Delaney, the committee assistant. Um, and we will take further testimony. I do want to hear from the hospital association um, as well as the medical uh, society and others involved with the hospitals as well as any, probably should hear Peggy from DCF as well that regulate the child care facilities. So I believe that- um, And VLCT. Uh, and VLCT, yeah, I mentioned that earlier. Um, but I believe uh, when I, was looked at as a foster home, I had to remove all weapons from the home to, to have a foster child. I would assume that there's similar requirements in the child care facilities that are licensed anyway. There's a locked rule also. I think if somebody does have some, they're required to be locked in a foster so home. So Chris, if, if you would go ahead and uh, hopefully we have enough time to hear from you, uh, we're gonna adjourn at 1045. Uh, very good. Uh, can everybody? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. You're yes. coming through fine. Uh, my name is Chris Bradley. Uh, I'm the president of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs. And in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I am a registered lobbyist with the Secretary of State on firearms issues. Um, I think I'd like to start just by thanking all of you um, for representing Vermont through these incredibly trying times. Zoom is not the intimacy that we usually have in Senate chamber. Uh, yes, I have more legroom here, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, I, I thank you and uh, it, it's, it's tough to persevere. Um, I, I'd especially like to thank Mr. Baruth. Um, he, uh, we had a, a very good conversation on Monday. Um, it's the type of conversation and discussion I think uh, we need uh, more often, um, and especially prior to the creation of bills. Uh, I am, I think we're a reasonable people. Um, 
I, I guess I, I'm going to start off by uh, uh, reminding, as I usually do, uh, about Vermont's status as the safest state in the nation. Uh, we are now the second safest state. We continually are either first or second. Uh, we are second to Maine. And uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont have exceptionally similar firearms laws. Um, the laws that we have stand in rather stark contrast uh, to what we see in, say, New York and Massachusetts, where we see literally double the violent crime rate that is in Vermont. Um, and, and what is the difference between those states, New York and Massachusetts, and Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, if it's not their firearms laws? So I, I leave that question. Um, firearms, as you know, are part of our culture. They're an integral part of, of many Vermonters' lives. Um, and, and it really represents the ability of, of a Vermonter to, do, to defend themselves. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the things I'd like to do a deep dive in, and I think uh, Matt touched upon it. Uh, I think Joe's been taking uh, notes on this. I'd really like to take a look at the crimes and criminal procedures that we have in Title 13 today that seem to address some of these aspects. Because I kept hearing uh, threatening behavior or criminal threats or uh, untoward behavior. Um, and I think we have laws that speak to that. Uh, let's start with uh, 13 VSA uh, 1023. Uh, that would be the simple assault statute, and I'm quoting, uh, a person is guilty of simple assault if he or she, number three, attempts by physical menace to put another in fear of imminent serious bodily injury. Moving on from that, we have uh, 1024, uh, aggravated assault. I'm mentioning aggravated assault because there's uh, two specific provisions there that exempt a citizen from the aggravated assault statute if it was in the just and necessary defense of his own or her own life, uh, wife, civil union partner, parent, child, brother, sister, guardian, or person under guardianship, or in the suppression of a person attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, burglary, or robbery. And, and I mention this only because our statutes clearly make provision for self-defense and it's not necessarily restricted to where that can occur. Moving on, I take a look at uh, 1020, uh, uh, 13 VSA 1025. I believe that was referenced by Mr. Valerio, uh, reckless endangering of another person. Um, reckless and danger shall be presumed when a person, person knowingly points a firearm at or in the direction of another whether or not that actor believed the firearm to be loaded and whether or not the firearm was actually loaded or not. Moving on to the next one, we have 4005. If I'm committing a crime and I have a gun, we have a law for that. Moving forward, 4009, negligent use of a gun. A person who carelessly or negligently wounds another person by gunshot shall be imprisoned, uh, not more than five years or fine $1,000. If I take a look at 4011, uh, aiming a gun at another, any person who shall intentionally point or aim any gun, pistol, or other firearm at any tor uh, or at, uh, towards another, except in self-defense or in lawful discharge, shall be punished. Um, moving forward from that, uh, 4017, uh, we have a statute that prohibits uh, felons from having firearms with some, some very, uh, with restrictions and penalties. Moving forward from that, I come to what we just recently wrestled through um, in previous years, uh, the uh, extreme risk protection order, uh, 4053, if somebody's acting up or acting out, we now have the, the ability to take action on those people. And I guess I I'm going to conclude here, if I could, by coming back, uh, is Eric Fitzpatrick still on the line? You may answer yes. that question, Eric. <laughs> yeah, present. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, I, I, I'm, could you take a look at, please, at 13 VSA 3705? 
That would be the unlawful trespass statute. I'm going to quote from it while you look at it. A person shall be in prison for not more than three months or fined not more than $500 or both if, without legal authority or the consent of the person in lawful possession, he or she enters or remains on any land or in any place as to which notice against trespass is given by B, signs or placards so designed and situated so as to give reasonable notice. I, I ask you, Eric, in the case of, say, a store that doesn't want you to come in uh, without a shirt on, um, and they place a sign that says, shirts are required. If a person comes in without a shirt, can law enforcement come in and remove that person? Yes or no? I think there's more of a process involved in the in the civil trespass prosecutions, but uh, I'd want to look at that a little bit further. Well, I, I didn't uh, need to put you on. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of a, uh, I'm a little troubled. Uh, I think what we, let, let Eric research this, and this is part of what we could have as a discussion um, regarding markup of the bill. I mean, I'm also wondering why we didn't include, why the sponsors of the bill didn't include other dangerous weapons in the, in the definition, similar to what the federal definition is. But uh, so I want to, you know, Eric said he'd look at that, but I think it's a good question in terms of, I, I think we need to look at what other laws are available, but I do, you know, if you're a private company, I'll use JC Penny because I just came off my head because they're out of business. Um, J.C. Penney can make any kind of rules they want about masks, about whatever, and um, about what can come in. It's the the government uh, facilities is where the um, you know we're looking at here. Uh, well, uh, Senator President Biden, uh, President Elect Biden, I guess it still is until noontime, uh, has already said he's going to um, mandate masks on federal lands and facilities. Um, I, I understand that. I guess, uh, and I, I've posed the question uh, specific to 3705, if a building or any, uh, such as the state house, they have a sign that says no firearms allowed. Um, it does seem to me uh, that 3705 may apply here, but I'm not going to beat that horse. It may. I, I, Chris, I think the important thing is for us as a committee, obviously is to get your opinions on the bill, but also before we pass a bill out of here is to us to make sure there isn't uh, conflicting law or other laws that already cover the behavior and not, not we don't want confusion. No, I, I, I understand, I, I guess. But my, my understanding and what I've been told is that while there's a requirement there, there is no absolute law against against it, even though the sign says you can't carry a firearm. It's a rule developed by the Joint Rules Committee, I believe, is what Eric said. And that that's as far as that goes. But it's not necessarily um, how enforceable is that rule and how would you enforce that rule? Those are the questions we have to ask ourselves. Well, certainly it's, it's as we say, a toolkit and there's a number of tools, I think, that are already in statute that, that clearly have some bearing on here. Um, and just as an aside, I believe the uh, school statute um, has an intent element, that there has to be some intent um, in, in any event. Uh, Mr. Campbell mentioned something about uh, knowing. And, and uh, how do you prove whether you know somebody did this by accident, an honest mistake? Uh, Chair Sears, you, you mentioned going to the airport and forgetting you had a, 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 an innocuous money clip that, that had a knife in it. And to many folks, um, they may forget that there is something that they carry all the time. But um, I, I guess one of the things that I, I would like to raise is, um, especially in the magazine ban that is now in the Supreme Court, um, one of the Supremes said, what else could Vermont have done to address this? 
um, to address the, the magazine question. And that really started me thinking, and I think it was along the lines of what Mr. Valerio was saying, is what do we have on the books already that address this? Um, if it's threatening, we have that. And it, it's, I'm, uh, my immediate response is, do we have data? And, and I don't think we do. We, we don't know a law that we just passed uh, in 2017, it became effective in 2018. It had to do with whether you were threatening one person or multiple people with some fairly stiff fines. I don't know if we know if that's ever been used at all. And even before that gets used, we're now looking at a, at a bill, S30, that is, there is no intent. You, you, you simply have a citizen that may either knowingly or unknowingly be in the wrong place and it's an honest mistake. So uh, I guess these are considerations we need to raise. Um, and frankly, I know sitting here in my usual fashion, I, I've, I've created a tome. I it got so big, I had to put a table of contents on it. So I'm, I'm taking a very high road. And, and, and just so you know, we have not hit the panic button with our people, um, 60 member clubs, over 11,000 individual members, we haven't hit the panic button on this because I know the Senate is going to be exceptionally deliberative on this and we're going to look at it from all sides. Um, I guess uh, on the face of it, I think we have to realize that S30 is only going to be really complied with by honest and law-abiding citizens. Um, it's, it's an unfortunate truth uh, and we can't escape the fact that in order for this law to be effective, law enforcement has to be present. And if that's the case, and we, we were, we've been dancing around this, um, if we want our employees to be safe, you need to take concrete measures to do that. And as we've seen, we have situations where some buildings have immediate protection and, and some don't. Um, so if this is to be effective, it really needs to have teeth behind it. In the case of courts, for example, um, and it's an interesting case, I go to court um, and yes, they're screened. I'm not allowed to have firearms in there. And if I was choosing- Other deadly to, weapon. A, a deadly weapon, thank you. Um, if I chose to take a firearm there and, and give up my right to self-defense, I am trading that off for the fact that I know that there are armed, trained people there to protect me. And to create the uh, illusion of safety by saying you can't do this is an illusion. Um, we are a rural state. Uh, we, we have a heavy reliance on police <clears throat> safety. And I believe for uh, 2019, Vermont had the lowest full-time equivalent for law enforcement officers in the country. Um, our state police covers 200 towns. 50% of our population, 90% of our land mass. Where is the protection for citizens? Uh, if you're going to do this enforcement, it means a significant investment in, in money, uh, of money for both equipment and personnel. Um, and, and, has a, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, Senator Baruth has a question and Senator White, but I remind everybody we got three minutes left. I, I, I did want to speak before we but ended. But I do want I to want invite to uh, uh, Chris Bradley to come back and lead okay. off the next and session um, because I know this discussion. Uh, you know, is I, if, if I could, um, yeah. first of all, thank, thank you to Chris uh, and Evan and, uh, for reaching out um, for a conversation to me. Appreciate it. Um, what I would say is, I understand that there are other laws on the books that speak to things that people might do with a gun, such as threaten uh, or shoot someone. I get that. This attempts to do something that there is no criminal prohibition against, which is bringing it to a certain <clears throat> location. So if, if you take the airport as an example, if, if I'm in the waiting area waiting to get on a plane, I, I don't want to see somebody with a gun and um, have to worry about what might happen with that gun. And fortunately, there's a law that protects me from having to worry about that. 
So there's a gun-free zone that you can't bring the gun in. It's not, did somebody threaten with a gun? Did they intend to bring a gun? Any of these other things that we've been talking about, it's simply, is there a gun in that space? And, you know, we've, we've um, agreed as a society, no guns in that space. Same with courthouses, same with schools. Now in schools, we don't, as a state, supply any money for guards, resource officers to enforce the prohibition on firearms there. So, um, you know, I, I think it's misleading to say that this bill would need to finance officers or, or teeth, as you put it. Um, what we're looking for is to create exactly what we have at schools, but at two other common sense locations, hospitals and government buildings. Um, with that said, um, I'll, I'll save whatever else I have to say for next time. The, the last thing I would say is that if, if we are gonna achieve consensus on this bill, I could not go along with a rewrite that converted this to a civil penalty. And I wanna just be very clear about that. If people are thinking of, of that as, a, as a, a way to weaken it and reach compromise, I, I can't go that far. I appreciate that. It's 1144. Chris, I hope you'll be able to come back at our next meeting and lead off um, with continuing testimony and uh, continuing thoughts. Um, Peggy, we have some time Friday morning that's left to be determined, or don't we? Uh, yes, we do from, uh, I believe it's 1045 to 1130. Okay, well, I, I think I'm going to leave that up leave that as is and, and take this up next week when we okay. can get to it. Others who would like to testify again, the offer is there. Um, one of the considerations the committee should take is should we have a public hearing on this bill um, or not? We've generally had public hearings when there's been a, a particular firearm bill um, before us. Second thing I want to remind us, this does not deal with protests and people carrying firearms. This is not that bill. Uh, we did have a post from somebody, I, a letter or email from somebody that's posted on our um, on our uh, committee page um, that um, is against doing that. And there may be another bill in the hopper that deals with that, but I'm not familiar with it. Um, if there is, but this bill does not deal with protests. So should I take that down? Uh, no, just, I just okay. wanted to, I just was looking at the documents that are on our committee webpage and okay. this gentleman wrote a concern about the protests and I just want to make clear that this bill is not about protests. Unless of course the protest was to occur inside of a government building. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Are, are we in general putting letters that we receive on the webpage? No. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we get a lot of them. I don't. I, I yeah. don't think they were. But well, it's it was I there. I think that would be a bad idea if we if we yep. went down that road. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, it's there. It's on the web page, and we should talk about what our policy is about posting it later. Maybe yep. that could be Friday morning's discussion. Is some of these further discussions about policies of the committee, and particularly now that we're meeting remotely. Um, and thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody, for all your testimony. Um, and we're adjourned until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Don't forget our floor session at 1. <laughs>